He's going to be tried and he's going to be crucified. He knows as they're walking and he's telling them this, he is about to lay down his life for them as the example. Now we can't do exactly what he did, but we can do as he did. Because we have limitations, because we are not God. 
the offering that he made for us is far superior in what he did than what we can do. First of all, Jesus did not have to die. He didn't. As a person, he didn't have to. I mean, he wasn't under the curse. Death had no claim on him. He was the life, the way, the truth. I am the life. You know, when we read about or hear about somebody who rushes into a burning building to save someone and they lose their life, they give their life to go in to try to save someone in this valiant rescue attempt, it is very tragic. It's heroic and it's very tragic. But the truth is that the person who ran into the building was at some point still going to die. This might have changed the timing, but this he was still going to die. Because all people have to die. But Jesus did not have to die. He was eternal. He chose to die. And so not only did he choose to die, but we know that his death was very intentional. Again, using the example of somebody who runs into a building to save someone. I don't think when they run into the building, they go, I'm going to save someone. And in their mind, they are not going, but I know I'm not going to make it. I am not going to get to that person. I am not going to save that person. I'm just going to die. That's not on their mind when they rush in. They go in thinking, I'm going in and I think, I think if I do this, I think I can get out and save me and them. There's a possibility that I'll survive. Jesus knew there was no possibility he was going to survive. When he laid down his life, he knew absolutely positively, not only was he going to die, but there was no escape. It was 100% certain. And no man can die and save someone spiritually. A man might be able to rush in and save someone out of a burning building and save them physically, but they cannot save them spiritually. Where Christ laid down his life and saved both physical and spiritual. Because no man can die to save another person's soul. So we're not commanded to do what he did, but to do it as he did it, to the degree that he did it. To love one another as he loves us. And that means we have to be willing, we have to have such a love motivating and pushing and driving us to motivate us to love and give ourselves up for our friends. Jesus is speaking to the disciples. Remember, this is the infant church. So when he is talking to them, he is talking to us. It is to us, the church. It is the command that Jesus makes to every single Christian. To love each other to the extent that you would be willing to lay down your life for each other. Because they're your friends. They're your friends. That's the measure that Jesus gives. That's the measure that he gives us to use in our relationship with other believers. And these believers, Jesus calls them, gives them a title. He calls them friends. Friends. There's several words that are translated love in the Greek. In our Bible, it'll just say love, but we don't know which one of those words because they have different meanings. Agape, you know, that's that's a one type of love. Uh, that's a, the love that Jesus has for mankind. You know, there's eros, that's a type of love. That's the one that you got for your wife or your or your husband. You know, the one that makes your heart go pity pat. That's a different kind of love, but still, that's eros, but still love. There's still another one that's called phileo. It's translated love, phileo. And that's a different love, and it means to have a deep affection for somebody. To have a personal attachment to somebody. And so it's usually a type of love that you would have for a dear member of your family. As a matter of fact, that word phileo is where we get the word Philadelphia. The city of brotherly love. Phileo. It's a brotherly love. And so geez, that word phileo, the object of that love... The name of the person that's the object of that 
is philos, and that is the word for friend. So when we love someone, we have a love for someone, this love that we would have for a dear family member. Jesus said, that's the kind of love you would have. You would do anything for your brother, your sister. You would do all of those things. He said, that's the kind of love. And that's what, when he says friend, that's the word he's using. In our translation, now we have friends and we tend to put them in different categories. Yeah, I got a really good friend. I got a couple of friends that I don't really hang out with. Okay, but that's not what Jesus is using. When he says they are your friends, he means these are people that you love and you care for because they are as if they are your brothers and sisters. And in the church, we refer to each other, don't we? As brothers and sisters. Hi, Brother Bill. Hi, Sister Mary. Right? We use those words. Those are the words that we have because they are friends. They are deeply beloved. So when Jesus died for us, we received his friendship. He died, his great love was so that he could make us his friends. And that's why he says, you're my friends if you do what I command. All right, great. What's the command? Love one another the same way that I love you. See how it all ties together? Now, John goes on to say, well, this is a different type of relationship. Now, Jesus is God. Jesus is the master. Jesus is awesome and holy. And he could demand anything because of who he is. And if for no other reason to obey him, it's because he is who he says he is. It's like when I grew up, when my dad told me to do something, he didn't have to give a reason. If he did, what was the reason? Because I said so. Right? Jesus could say, do this because I said so. But Jesus said, listen, I'm doing this not as a master would have to a slave. That's not how I'm telling you. I'm telling you this as, as friends. I'm telling you this. You are people I love. You are beloved to me. You're my friends. And how you know the difference is a boss would just tell you something. When I had my business, I had employees. And if I was going to sit down and, and uh, shop for insurance policies, I didn't call all the guys in and talk to them and see what they thought. If I was looking to change the suppliers, if I was looking to setting up a new sales plan, if I was looking towards getting a loan and getting a couple of new trucks, I didn't invite them all and get their input. We just chat about it at the table. <coughs> no, I was the boss. I had no reason to, to confide in them any of that stuff. I was here. They were there. And he treated them as friends. And Jesus says, I'm not treating you as a master treats his slave. A master just says, go do this, go get that, do what I said, don't ask questions. Jesus said, that's not how I'm treating you. Because you're not that. You're my friends. And we know that he's a friend because he does confide in us. God wants us to be his friend. And he wants to talk with us, confide with us, have communion with us, communication with us. That's what this is. When God is willing to stop and relay His plan for humanity to you and all of His promises, and He wants to give you all of these things, you're more than just a servant. <coughs> you're His friend. Oh, what a friend we have in Jesus. And Jesus is saying it is important he says, I am treating you, I am loving you as a friend, and you need to turn around and you need to treat each other and love them as a friend. And have communion. And have dialogue. And be there for each other. And to love each other and care for each other. Folks, this is the vital part of the church that so many congregations are missing. It's sad when a church has a, an 8 o'clock service and an 11 o'clock service. And the people at the 8 o'clock service have no idea who the people at the other service are. Or what their needs are. Well, I'm a member of the church, but I don't really know that I need to go. Really? Well, first of all, the Lord said, do not forsake the gathering of saints. 
Okay, so yeah, you gotta go. But the other reason, how are you gonna pray for somebody if you don't know what they're going through? How are you gonna hug somebody when you're at home in your fuzzy slippers and eating bonbons watching reruns of Charles Stanley? I love Charles Stanley, but that's not what he had intended. Matter of fact, he will tell you, I love it when you watch, but you need to get up and go to church, be a part of the congregation. It is the love of the community. The Bible calls this koinonia. It's the Greek word for what we have when we gather together. Koinonia. It means a shared life. You got a life, and you got a life, and you got a life, and I got a life, and we can all go to our separate corners and live it. That is not what Jesus had in mind. He came up with his church. Where I come out of my corner, and your corner, and your corner, and your corner, and we meet in the middle, and we hug each other, and we do whatever we can to support each other for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and how can we go out and be a better servant and witness for Him? That's what He's talking about. We need to love each other in such a way that we are such dear and close friends. When we have our prayer time, we raise up. I have a friend who has this need. I have a friend listening. You will have friends. I had a friend who called me. I hadn't talked to him in years. And they called me because they said we weren't really sure who else to call. That's what it means to be a friend. And oh, when I sent them a text that I had put them on the prayer list, I put Barbara on the prayer list, she said, you don't know what that did for us and how much that meant to us have brothers and sisters they already have a church but to have more brothers and sisters who for no other reason other than the love of Jesus Christ befriended them enough and care for them enough to pray for them and to have concern for them and that's what Jesus is talking about when he says lay down your life he doesn't necessarily mean you got to go and jump in front of a bus to save somebody although if, if it comes up Lay down your life. Surrender. That's what it means to lay down your life. Are you willing to surrender your time, your schedule, your talents? Your, this is what I want to do for the sake of the needs of someone else. I might have this need, and I have this need, and I have this need, but I also have this resource. And rather than worrying about my need, I'm more worried about someone else's. And how would I know? Unless I am part of their world and part of their friendship and fellowship. Jesus says we should lay down our lives, surrender ourselves, gather together, pray together, study the scriptures together, worship together, be a part of a congregation together. And it means to put aside the many, many other things that cause us to separate ourselves from each other. And the only way that that's going to be possible, folks, is when we choose to love each other the way that Jesus loves us. When we decide and choose to become friends to others in the same way, in the same degree that He befriended us. 1 John 3.16 I think this is what John when he wrote this epistle meant in this passage when he said we know love by this that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren that word is the word Now, before I give you my last little conclusion, let me say this. As a pastor, it moves my heart to see the heart that you, as a congregation, have for each other. Amen. You are such a blessing. I am preaching today to the choir. You love each other. You care for one another. You befriend each other. 
I am the envy of a lot of pastors of much bigger churches when I tell them about your love. God has blessed me mightily. Amen. And I am so thankful for you. But keep in mind, for each of us, there is still always room to continue to grow. But I have to say, when other people come to this church and they come the first time or I get to talk to them after they've been here the second time, do you know what they almost always say? It was such a friendly group of people. I felt like I fit in. I felt like a friend. Everyone was so kind and so nice. Where do we get that? Well, we get it from Jesus. Because if he can make a friend out of me, I figure it ought to be easy for me to make friends out of others. I commend you as a church and as a fellowship. Keep up the good work. Because you're living the life and being a witness of what it means to be a friend to brothers and sisters in Christ. Having said that, <laughs> what can we take away from this passage this morning? First, we have to remember David. Because it's not something you do once and you're done. Every day we need to remember, call into our minds that great, great love that Jesus displayed towards us by laying down his life for us. We need to think about that. Meditate on that. Contemplate that. And secondly, we need to consider the great honor and privilege that a holy God, an awesome creator, who made the entire universe of which man will never be able to find the boundaries of, nor even can imagine the size of it and the scope of it, that this God of all things created in his universe this tiny speck of dust called earth. And on that speck of dust are living creatures that God loved so much that he died for and made them friends called us to be friends to others. Out of all the universe, He called us. And then let's just remember to ask ourselves each day, how is it that I can put that love on display? Who can I care for? Who can I pray for? Who can I reach out to? How can I surrender my life today for the benefit of others? How can I be a little bit more of a friend to the believers around me? It can be in the congregation or otherwise. How can the words of Jesus in this passage today bless me to bless others? It's easy if we we'll only remember the pattern that Jesus gives us. With great love comes friendship. And with friendship flows great love. Hallelujah. Amen. Father God, we thank you. Lord, may we bless your name each and every day as we remember the great love that you have for us. Jesus has given us many ways that we can put that on display. And that because of this great love, Lord, that we would abide with Him. And that we would obey Him. And that we would trust Him. And that we would love each other as He loved us. Lord, in this life, in our routine, we get sidetracked so easily. We are distracted so easily. Help us to keep our focus on who we are. Beloved children of God, friends of the Lord Jesus, and He has called us, even commanded us, to be friends and love one another. Lord, we thank You for the help that You give in that regard. Amen.